Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Don Carlton, Executive Director of the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, good afternoon. Uh, the Briscoe Center is delighted to sponsor uh, this session this afternoon, which is titled The War and the Fourth Estate. We're especially proud to, to sponsor the session because the center houses a valuable archive of papers and photographs documenting the history of the American news media, including the papers of Walter Cronkite and Morley Safer, and the photographic archives of Eddie Adams, Dirk Halstead, Steve Northup, and David Kennerly. The Briscoe Center has produced an exhibit of documentary material selected from these and other collections relating to the various aspects of the Vietnam War. This exhibit is titled Vietnam, Evidence of War, and it's currently on display on the third floor of the LBJ Library. So I invite all of you uh, who are attending the summit uh, to come and visit our exhibit while you're here. Now today we're honored to have two renowned journalists on our panel who will explore the crucial role that the media played in shaping perceptions of the Vietnam War. Those panelists are Peter Arnett, a Pulitzer Prize and Emmy Award winning correspondent who has spent nearly a lifetime covering wars and international crises for major American news organizations. Arnett covered the Vietnam War for the Associated Press for 13 years, from the buildup of U.S. military advisors in the early 1960s to the fall of Saigon in 1975. Arnett wrote more than 2,000 news stories from Vietnam for the Associated Press, and he has written several books, including his autobiography, Live from the Battlefield, and his memoir on the Vietnam War called The Fall of Saigon. And then Dan Rather. My friend Dan Rather has been a fixture in broadcast news for over six decades during which he has won every major journalism award. Dan has interviewed every president since Eisenhower, and he's covered almost every important dateline of the last 60 years, including, of course, extensive coverage of the Vietnam War. Dan spent 43 years at CBS, 24 years of which he served as the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News. Today, he is founder, president, and CEO of News and Guts, an independent production company specializing in nonfiction content. Our moderator is Andrew Sherry, who is vice president of communications at the Knight Foundation, which is the country's leading funder of journalism and media innovation. As a journalist, Sherry was based in Hong Kong, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Nicosia, and Paris, first for AFP News Agency and then Dow Jones, where he became a regional editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review. One of his most memorable assignments included covering the opening of Vietnam. Please join me in welcoming our panel today. Thanks for that intro, it's really great to be here. Um, we are very fortunate to be here with uh, two reporters whose long and storied careers actually personify the healthy tension uh, between a free press and government. Uh, just a word on, uh, on format, I, think I wanna spend the first half of the panel uh, asking, I'm gonna be leading the questions of two of them so we can bring out the range of insights that they have to offer, which really go from experiences in Vietnam to 
the evolution of the relationship between the press and the military in later conflicts to you know, look forward at what the fragmentation of the media landscape and its implications are. Now, um, Peter, you were in Vietnam from your, probably your first reporting trip was 1962 before the U.S. military buildup, and you didn't leave until 1975 after the fall of Saigon. Yeah, basically, yeah. So why don't you, why don't you set the scene for us? With the you know, I, w I was here through the conference all yesterday and here for Henry Kissinger's presentation, and I, overnight I made a few notes because it was happened, a long, <laughs> happened a long time ago, but I think it's clear from the panel discussions of this conference so far that important policies of President Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon involving Vietnam were carefully concealed from the American public. To maintain what I call a deception, the media policies of all three presidents attempted heavy-handed news manipulation and intimidation of reporters in the field and their superiors back home. The objective was to proceed with actions in Vietnam that if publicly debated would meet resistance at home and concern abroad. Now, our leaders endeavored to compel a powerful news industry with its long tradition of bold war reporting to bend to the whims of policymakers making questionable judgments on issues important to the American public, judgments often made far from the battlefields. In earlier significant American wars, the government with official censorship took upon itself the burden of deciding what news was fit to print, what information gathered by reporters in the field might harm the security of military operations, or what might not, to keep on message in terms of achieving the overall objectives and keeping the support of the public at large. But not for the war in Vietnam an enterprise deemed too sensitive, politically too, by, too, sorry, let me say that again. The war in Vietnam, an enterprise deemed too sensitive to justify censorship. So from the beginning, as early as June 1962, when I arrived in Saigon, assigned to the AP Bureau, there were the beginnings of the credibility gap plaguing media and military relations that only worsened as the years went by. In the course of our discussions this afternoon, I know we'll track this uh, evolved situation and that continue to plague American media relations. But I'll conclude these initial remarks by quoting a letter sent to President Kennedy on June 18, uh, 1963, by the president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, Herbert Drucker, then editor of the Hartford Courant, in which he refers to an incident during a Buddhist protest in Saigon uh, to the policies of President No Dinh Diem, uh, mid 1963, when I was beaten up by plainclothes police and was later arrested with my AP colleague, Malcolm Brown, and held on assault charges. Mr. Drucker's letter in part said, quote, in recent weeks, as you were aware, Mr. President, there have been charges that Vietnamese secret police pummeled, knocked down, and kicked American reporters and smashed their cameras. The letter concluded, it is not yet certain that all possible efforts are being made to prevent further deliberate obstacles to free reporting. Whatever the difficulties, we urge you to bear in mind the need for the American people to have the fullest possible factual information from South Vietnam, no matter what anyone may think is right or wrong about the situation there. This letter not only represented the full support of the mainstream, mainstream media for open reporting from Vietnam at that time, but remained the view of editors and TV producers at home who supported the walk, work of journalists in the field for the entirety of the war. 
Well, I hope people in, in the audience have been taking notes as well, because we will open it up for questions and comments at the end. Um, that was an interesting insight about the importance of the support that you got from the mainstream media. Um, Dan, I'm really interested in hearing, since you, you went back and forth between Vietnam and New York, I'm interested in hearing how different was it the first time you arrived? How, what type of reception did you get for your reporting back, you know, and, and how much did your network support you in telling what you felt was the complete story? Well, I went to Vietnam the first time in uh, October of 1965 and stayed uh, the better part of a year. I was back another three times after that, but never for that long. In answer to your question, uh, when I went to Vietnam, uh, it was very clear to me, and it remained very clear to me throughout uh, all the time I was there, that I had the complete unmitigated support of not just the CBS News as a division of CBS Inc., but the full support of uh, the corporate entity that owned CBS News. At that time, William S. Paley, who had founded CBS News, uh, was still head of the corporation. But there never was any question whatsoever about uh, having support of, of, quote, the brass back home. Mm -hmm. uh, that, had a, that was a long CBS News tradition. They helped establish it as a, the um, predominant uh, position of electronic journalism in general. Just, there wasn't any doubt about it. Um, that when I went the first time, I was um, unprepared for, for, to cover the war. Perhaps it can be said of most correspondents they're unprepared to cover the war. I had covered war before. I had covered a, the India-Pakistan war uh, in the summer of 1965. But this was the first time that I had uh, been privileged, and I use the word measuredly, to cover uh, American men and women. At that time, it was almost exclusively men uh, in combat. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, to say I was unprepared is to, to understate it. Uh, but I remember the first time, uh, it was three days after I arrived, uh, I quickly went north to i -Corps and covered an operation, which is, say, a combat operation near Tom Key. And that was the first time that I had seen in-person eyewitness uh, to war in which, you know, my neighbors and the young sons of, of people uh, all over the country were involved. And, um, be perfectly honest about it, I never got over the shock of it. Uh, real mud, real blood, real screams of the wounded, moans of the dying. Uh, that, and when I saw the first wounded American that I'd ever seen in combat, uh, I have no apology for saying, uh, I first threw up and then I wept. What was the, what was the impact that your reporting was having back in the United States. Or you also, Peter, you were writing for the Associated Press, which was being sent all, all around the world. What, what kind of feedback were you give, getting on the impact of your storytelling? Well, in the first uh, three months I was there in, in, in uh, 1962, we were getting messages from a Washington bureau saying, how come their coverage in Washington of the government, of the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House was 180 degree different from ours on what was happening in Vietnam. <laughs> now, well, personally, those of us who are in Vietnam really were not concerned too much about our reporting buddies in Washington. Uh, we were really concerned about what, was, what we were seeing in the field. When I was assigned to Vietnam, Wes Gallagher, the AP president, said, Peter, Report the truth, report what you see, and uh, we'll support you all the way. Uh, when I arrived, of course, there was Neil Sheehan was working for UPI, uh, David Halberstam came in for the New York Times, Malcolm Brown for the AP with a great photographer, Horst Fass, Stanley Kano was uh, coming in and out of Hong Kong uh, for Time Magazine. All of us were reporting what we were finding in the field. What were we finding? American advisors who were 10,000 when I arrived would come to Saigon or would meet in the field who would start complaining about the reluctance of the South Vietnamese military to, uh, to sort of listen to their advice. Uh, there was an incident, the Battle of Up Bak on the uh, first few days of 1963, 
uh, where several American helicopters were shot down and, and uh, Americans were killed on the ground. Well, we were tipped off by one of the pilot, helicopter pilots who called us from Tansenyut to tell us about it. Now, Neil Sheehan and the Reuters guy flew in a helicopter to the scene. I drove down to uh, up Bach, uh, 40 miles south of Saigon, with Steve Stibbins, a, a Texan who happened to be working for the uh, Stars and Stripes at the time in his Jeep. Now, we got our information from the Americans on the ground, and the information we were getting also politically was that the American role in Vietnam wasn't working. I'll add one other point. In December of 1962, the uh, Senate uh, Speaker of the Senate, or leader of the, the, the Senate, Mike Mansfield, visited Vietnam with a team. He asked to meet us at the Caraval Hotel. We thought he wanted us to brief him. He briefed us on what he felt were the negatives about the no Dinh Diem regime, uh, the information he had picked up all week during his visit, he criticized the American embassy, and what was interesting, he went back and briefed President Kennedy on his version of the war, which was very similar to our version. This didn't stop the pressure because soon after that, President Kennedy called the, the, uh, the managing editor of the New York Times asking that Halberstam be reassigned. This raises a very important point that Peter's just made, and you asked me when I first got up to Vietnam, that from the very first moments uh, I was in Vietnam, the distance between what was the reality on the ground, what you bore witness to, and what was being spoken in Washington and what was being talked about uh, all over the country, was that such variance, it was a shock. It was a shock that never subsided, that the longer you were in Vietnam, the more you had to say to yourself, what I'm seeing is not matching what the politicians are saying. Uh, and as I say, the longer I was there, the greater this gap got. And I'll give you a quick anecdote with going forward now. When I came out of Vietnam after the first time being there for almost a year, um, very shortly I was made the White House correspondent for CBS News. I had been briefly before, but at any rate, uh, I was. Uh, uh, an associate of President uh, Johnson said, you know, perhaps you'd like to come to the briefing room downstairs, so-called situation room, and uh, we can give you a, a briefing on what's going on. I found that somewhat curious that they were going to give me a briefing of what was going on yeah. by people who had never been there <laughs> or had only been there for a very short time. At any rate, I'll try to keep it short, but I, I, this never left my mind, and it, it underscores much of what Peter has just referred to. So I was taken down to the Situation Room, and uh, walked up a Rostow, a, a good and decent American, a very intelligent, intellectual gentleman, uh, gave a briefing on the battlefield situation. So, well, he pointed with his pointer to one particular place on the Cambodian border near what later became known the Hook, this little piece of Vietnam goes into Cambodia. And he was describing, quote, the, the success of our armor there. I'm saying to myself, one of two things is very, very evident here. Either, and I hate to use the word, either he's lying through his teeth or he is vastly misinformed because just before I had left Saigon, I had been in that very area, which is swampy. Uh, believe you me, nobody takes armor in there. They hadn't had many armor. But you know, in, in short, just as an anecdote, I think it encapsulates what it was. I, I give oh, Professor Rostow the benefit of the doubt. I think he actually believed it. But from that moment on, uh, when I went back to, Psych uh, to Vietnam later on, I always had that in mind. Now, right there was the, the nut of the problem, if you will, that people who had been there, people like uh, Peter Barnett, and let me pause and say, there has never been a braver, a more correspondent, a more valor than Peter Ornette, who was there for all those old years. But the kind of thing that, that Peter and Malcolm Brown and Neil Sheehan and Halbert Stamp had been reported uh, was it such variance that if, if you had any, any decency as a journalist at all, you had to say to yourself, listen, I've been there. I've spent almost more than a year there, almost a year there, 
And what I saw does not match this briefing that I'm getting. Now, the briefing, if that's the briefing the president got, yeah. then we can see how the problem developed over years. So what do you think it is that made the relationship between the press, military, and government so different in Vietnam than it was, say, in World War II or Korea? Um, because, you know, it seems like some of the military assumed that it was a problem with society or with the press, but there could be other arguments that it, the nature of the conflict was fundamentally different, so it led people to behave differently. Which, you know, which do you think? Well, I'll answer that. Censorship is the difference. Hmm. Exactly. I remember talking to Walter Cronkite about censorship in World War II, and he says, I didn't particularly like it, but he says, you know, I did have access to the whole war. You know, he flew into over Normandy, I believe, in a glider on, on D-Day. But he said, at least I had access to the war, and after the war, we could come out, and we know all about it. Uh, I imagine censorship was not introduced into uh, Vietnam. I interviewed Dean Rusk after the war, who was Secretary of State, formerly, and he said, well, he didn't feel the, 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 the climate, political climate in America at the time would have supported that kind of onerous uh, restrictions involved in having censorship of a war theater. Okay, well, without censorship then, uh, we, were, we were free to, to go and report stories where we could find them. What is not understood, that each American division that landed in Vietnam came from hometown, you know, from Fort Bragg to the 1st Cav or Fort Hood for the 4th Division, uh, the 25th Infantry Division, the Pineapple Division from Hawaii, those soldiers wanted the folks back home to know what they were doing in Vietnam. The information officers from these units would come to Saigon and lobby for the attention of the media. I'm sure Dan was invited many times. The Marines had a very successful operation to invite journalists. All of the units wanted our appearance. Now, in the course of my time in Vietnam, I wrote 2, 000, over 2,000 stories. Many of them were written with these troops in the field and uh, kept getting invited back. So in terms of the, of the antagonism between the military and the media, it didn't exist in Vietnam. Did you feel antagonistic no, in quite, any no, unit you went to? No, no, quite the contrary. And this is a strong point. Uh, with television, even more than print, and I give great credit to the photographers who uh, will be in the session, following this session. But in television, you have to have the pictures. And in Vietnam, we had, as a, as a journalist, we had an ideal situation, and I think the military thought they had an uh, ideal situation. Peter's point that the military wanted you to be up front they wanted you to be in the middle of combat. They wanted you to film it. It was all film, not videotape, because we were still operating the film. Here's the way it worked with television, that we could go anywhere in Vietnam that we wanted to go. We were basically in the hitchhiking business, mostly by helicopter, sometimes by plane, once in a while by uh, ground convoy. But you could go anywhere, and as a consequence, you know, we reported individual correspondents could report, and I did myself, from i Corps in the far north all the way to the Mekong Delta to the south and everything in between. The military during the Vietnam War was eager for correspondents to see the war as it was and to have that transmitted back, back to the states. They were, they were eager. Now, on the question of censorship, I, I do agree that the big difference was in World War II and in the Korean War, there was censorship. No censorship during the Vietnam War. And frankly, I think the American people were served much better by, this, by the circumstances in Vietnam, vis-a-vis -vis the press and the military, uh, than perhaps they ever had been. But one decent, intending, honest people could differ about that. That's my own opinion. But here's the point, that it's frequently said, well, and the military and what led to restrictions on the press, for example, compare Gulf War I, or roughly the 1990 period, the first Gulf War, the military's whole mindset had changed to they didn't want correspondents to see combat, and they successfully prevented uh, news coverage of what I would call um, 
Ernie Pyle kind of dog face yeah. what the average soldier is going through. They yeah. didn't want the public to see. It. So there was a sea change, to use a cliche, mm -hmm. between go for War I and what had happened in Vietnam. The military thought they had learned a lesson. They learned the wrong lesson. Their lesson was, listen, keep the press out. Don't let the press see what the war is like. And in terms of Vietnam, one of the things that the military and uh, the administration, whether it's Kennedy, Johnson, or Nixon administration, didn't want you to see was the effect of the war on civilians. Listen, anybody who's seen war knows this truth. War is idiotic, it's terrible, it's ghastly, it's savage for everybody involved. But those who suffer the most are women, children, and old people. And the military never wanted you to see the civilian casualties. They never wanted you to emphasize that. So uh, going forward to the Gulf War I, uh, in the rough period of 1990, it was our job, the military public affairs officers, were given the job, you keep the press out. Keep the press out from anything approaching frontline combat, and for God's sakes, don't let them see uh, any civilian casualties. I have a couple of points quickly to yeah. make. Yeah. I've written down a few. But you know, with Dan being here, but I'll tell the story he should tell, that uh, Morley Safer, our treasured colleague, who I hear is quite ill these days, but he did a, a piece from Cam Ne, a village in Vietnam in 65, that was shown on CBS. And President Johnson watched it, picked up the phone in the early hours of the morning and called the president of CBS, who was Bill, uh, uh, no, he called Dr. Frank Stanton. Frank yeah, Stanton Frank was the Stanton, president, second said, man down in the corporate order. Frank, your boy this morning shat on the flag because of the nature of this report. I'll just give you a few other things. Now, the Johnson administration in 765 tried to limit the coverage. The AP was a prime target, my organization. My own reports, graphic reports that Dan has been talking about, uh, riot gas experiments on the military operations early in the war, equipment failures, weapon shortages, uh, so angered Washington that President Johnson ordered the FBI at one point to rake through my life looking from some dirt to silence me. He did the same with John Chancellor. Uh, and the, now, AP headquarters was aware of the generalities of the criticism, but only much later did we learn the extent of White House unhappiness. Press Secretary Bill Moyers, a revered journalist later, and I'm sure a good pal of yours, observed a 1965 memo when he was Press Secretary to the President that the coverage of CBS correspondent Morley Safer and me, Peter Arnett, was, quote, irresponsible and prejudiced, unquote, and because we were foreign born, we did not have the basic American interests at heart, because Morley was from Canada. Now, Moyers promised to tighten things up, and the president scrolled good on the message. Now, I was indeed foreign born from New Zealand, but some of my old schoolmates, were officers in the Kiwi New Zealand forces in Vietnam who were in Australia in combat alongside US soldiers. Now, when presidential assistant Jack Valenti heard that the AP president, Wes Gallagher, was coming to the White House to meet to discuss White House criticism, Valenti wrote, quote, you might want to bring up the problem of Peter Arnett who has been more damaging to the U.S. cause than a whole battalion of Viet Cong. <laughs> okay, for the meeting, Wes Gallagher was prepared to counter the criticism, bearing a briefcase filled with photos and facts supporting the disputed stories. The day prior to the meeting, two AP, managing, AP member managing editors reported to Gallagher that the president had volubly complained to them about my coverage. The AP chief went to the meeting uh, anxious to resolve this issue. Now, the American president and Gallagher were a formidable pair. Both were tall, tough people, tough-minded. But the luncheon went on and drew to an end with no mention of the war. Gallagher said at, at last, Mr. President, I understand you have been critical of some of AP's stories from Vietnam. Oh no, the president replied. I think the AP is doing a great job. <laughs>
not willing to challenge the president on what he'd been told a few days earlier by the managing editors, Gallagher said, well, I just want you to know, Mr. President, that the AP is not against you or for you. Well, Wes Johnson replied, that is not quite the way I like it. <laughs> Classic Johnson. <laughs> that is fantastic. You know, if I may, I think that one, one important thing rings through here. Let's take the, the great morning saver report on the burning of village huts, which was a, was a shock when it got through. The difference between yesterday, Vietnam, and today is very important that, without being preachy for every citizen to understand. While it's true that President Johnson picked up the phone and gave Frank Stanton, the second man down in the CBS corporate entity, uh, gave him unmitigated hell about the safer report, applied maximum pressure. At no time was there even the slightest indication that Bill Paley, who owned the company, or Dr. Stanton, who ran the company, was going to influence coverage in any way. And that was true of NBC, and ABC was not the news organization then that it is now, but nonetheless, I hope the point can be grasped that you know, quali quality journalism, whether it's covering war or anything else, particularly in times of war, quality journalism begins with an owner, a publisher, a leader who has guts who will back his reporters. And through the length and breadth of the Vietnam War, there was all kinds of pressure put on corporate leaders, such as Bill Paley. And I know of no instance in which they caved to it. Now, you rack forward now, we're talking 50 some odd years later. The whole corporate structure of so much of national distribution news is controlled by a few very large international conglomerates. There's a whole different atmosphere. Journalists are operating in a, in, a, in a different kind of arena in which all too often, there are exceptions, but all too often, the corporate leadership doesn't have the sensitivity about the value to society, to American society, of a truly independent, fiercely fighting independent and necessary press. During the Vietnam War, that existed with the owners at almost every corporate level. I'm sorry to say it no longer exists that way. I think it's an interesting point that, you know, the, the, there was very little press criticism, you know, within the military even, uh, during the actual coverage of the war. I mean, there were reporters everywhere. And we were welcome, we were willing to take any kind of risk for a story, and we were often with soldiers who just appreciated our company. It was only in the latest stages, really the Nixon presidency, when the U.S. with, with, with withdrawing with no real victory in sight, that, the, that the, the tension started to materialize between the military and the, the... I have a quick note here from William Hammond, who's one of the most prominent military historians of the Vietnam War. He did a two-volume official study. And he wrote in one book, in the end, what happened in Vietnam between the U.S. and the military on one hand and the news media on the other was symp sym symptomatic of what happened in the United States as a whole. He mentioned that at the beginning, the U.S. had supported the war effort, as did most Americans. The idea of containing China and Russia behind a, uh, an anti-communist Vietnam. And he said that with many deaths and, and under the influence of many deaths and contradictions, directions in the public changed and significant portions of the leadership in American society moved to re repudiate the earlier decision. Uh, and even, uh, you know, news organizations, newspapers that had supported the war started to turn against it. And Hammond mentioned that the military and the government was unable to follow this idea that the war was not worth continuing. And with most of the soldiers out, those who were remaining behind in Vietnam, whether in the embassy or in the military units, they stayed to retrieve whatever national face they could those of their members most emotionally tied to the failed policy fixed their anger upon the news media, the most visible exponent of the society that appeared to have rejected them. 
the recriminations we see today became the most in inevitable result. So it was only after the war that we had these numerous meetings between the, the media and the military arguing about policy and so forth. It was because we lost the war. <laughs> we won the war, you know, the, the press wouldn't have faced the kind of criticism that still exists today. That's fascinating. You both have brought up a number of actually very significant things regarding the war and the fourth estate and some significant changes over time. I mean, you talked about how when you go to the first, first Gulf War, uh, the military had learned some good lessons from Vietnam, like have a defined objective and have a plan for pulling out afterwards. But the lesson that they took toward the press was to basically isolate them by only allowing embedding or mostly allowing embedding. I think you could also even suggest in the Iraq war, um, you know, government took it to another level, almost went on the offensive with, the, uh, with uh, information about weapons of mass destruction that turned out not to be accurate. Um, to, you know, but just looking at that, how much of the things around the, the, around the Iraq war and the Iraq invasion was that, um, you know, people in the Pentagon Playing, you know, playing the New York Times, or was also the 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 press caught up in somewhat of a patriotic fervor post 9/11, things like that, and actually dropped the ball. Well, I think uh, the it, the latter uh, is the greater truth, and I will make it clear that uh, in this criticism of the press in general uh, during the period leading up to the Iraq War and the early stages of the Iraq War, I do not accept myself from the criticism I'm about to give. Uh, that by the time we got to the invasion uh, of the Iraq War, there were certainly uh, exceptions. The Maventi Group, for example, uh, was an exception. But by and large, by the time we reached that point, uh, American journalism in general, I'm sorry to say, had lost some of its spine. Uh, and there was, we, we, and I speak for myself and others, um, noting there's some exceptions, got caught up in questions would arise in your mind, but you say, you know, if you raise those questions, you're going to pay a very heavy price. I've used this metaphor before, but because it's one that works, that to ask the tough question and to ask the tough follow-up question, because frequently a follow-up question can elicit more than the original question, you were going to have a sign put around your neck, unpatriotic, liberal, left-wing, bomb-throwing Bolshevik or something. So that built in, this is not by way of excuse, there are no excuses, it's by way of explanation. That we, to mix metaphors, we lost our guts in many ways. It was, listen, you know that the questions need to be asked about this, but this train is rolling, we're going to war. And the, the price, while well, Every journalist knew it, and in every newsroom it was palpable, but nobody wanted to talk about it, was a certain amount of, I'll use the word, cowardice. It was, if you question this too much, if you don't get on board this invasion train that's moving here, you're going to wind up metaphorically like in South Africa once when the worst of the South African Civil War was underway, they would put a burning tire around people's neck uh, who descended with whatever the power structure wanted to do. So metaphorically, as a journalist, you said to yourself, you're going to get, if not that sign marking you as an unpatriotic person, you're going to have this burning tire put around you. I repeat, this is not by way of excuse. It's by way of explanation. So the press in general, once again noting that there were some exceptions, said, listen, the President of the United States says that it's about stopping possible nuclear war, chemical warfare, and there was also talk of being tied in with Al-Qaeda, which also turned out to be untrue. But uh, having said that we lost our guts, or if you like the spine metaphor better, when, when a President of the United States, who after all is not only head of, head of state but head of government, when he says something, and when the whole administration was orchestrated for one point of view, then any voices of dissent 
press or otherwise, got obliterated, and most of us didn't speak up when we should have spoken up, we didn't ask the right questions. So when I say the latter part you described, was it, was it a case of everybody, frankly, we Americans were afraid to use the word propaganda, but there was an immense propaganda campaign to build American public opinion for the war. And I compliment those in journalism who stood up at the time in the face of that, but overwhelmingly American journalism did not, including myself. Now, the first Gulf War really changed the, the whole nature of foreign coverage. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it represented uh, the American media, certainly the one that CNN and Ted Turner was creating in the 80s, and ultimately Tom Johnson uh, was supervising, uh, decided to expand the restraints beyond American involvement in, say, the conflict of war such as Iraq, to cover the other side, to look at both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. This hadn't happened in the past. Now, Saddam Hussein and his people invited CNN to stay, and actually other media were, you know, in included. But it was CNN that decided to stay in Baghdad. And uh, why, did we, why did we do that? One was the vision of Ted Turner, who believed that CNN could be a vehicle to get both sides of international stories in particular. The other was that we had the technology to actually effectively do live coverage of a war theater. This hadn't happened before, the six or seven satellite. This was helped by Tom Johnson, your own Tom Johnson people, who had taken over CNN a few months earlier, and he had used his contacts to have one of the first cell phones, which was of 80 pounds in a box, <laughs> sent, to, sent to Baghdad. And, uh, and we were able then, when the war started, to, to cover it despite great objections uh, from the U.S. government and, and, and others and, and, and opponents of moving in that direction to give the other side uh, coverage. My interview with Saddam Hussein during the war attracted a lot of criticism, but Dan had interviewed him prior to the war and right. didn't attract any criticism at all, right? Very the war, Iraq changed from being, you know, a, a, you know a, a story to be covered that the moment American troops were in action, you know, it became, it became a forbidden territory. But not to Ted Turner, not to CNN. So I was the only reporter for much of the war in Baghdad covering with a, with a, a team, a wonderful team of, of CNN personnel covering it live. The second Gulf War in 2003, there were 40 other live television units and the whole nature of international coverage changed because the communications allowed you know, the reports from ordinary people all across the globe. I think the effect of this, uh, there was a, a negative effect on the US military because uh, they, they closed up the, the, the access to their own people and uh, because of this barrage of information, they wanted to control it. But by doing that, journalists, say in Iraq, who were, who were really unhappy with the embedding and would go and were reluctant to do much coverage with the US because they were rarely allowed in any kind of action. You couldn't take any pictures of wounded Americans or you know, any American casualties. But however, reporters could go all over the countryside you know, I think most Pulitzer Prizes given for international coverage, including this year's from the New York Times, was for stories about ordinary people mm -hmm. living in, in victims of the war. And all these stories added up to essentially a, you know, a, a criticism of America involvement. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's been a, an explosive mixture of technology and, and what we're seeing today. Well, we, may, we haven't talked much about technology, but in thinking about Vietnam, our subject of the day, uh, it's been more than 50 years ago. But in Vietnam, keep in mind, there was no live battlefield coverage. Everybody now is, they accept live battlefield coverage, uh, or at least on scene coverage. 
But in Vietnam, remember I mentioned earlier we were in film, if as a correspondent you covered Tam Ki, which I mentioned earlier, you filmed the battle, the, there was no putting it up on the satellite from Vietnam. There was not only were there no cell phones, there were uh, virtually no telephone contact. Yes, if you happened to be in Saigon and stood in line at the government telephone building, you get it. There was only communication was basically by telex machine. So the film, you filmed the Tam Ki, you put it on the helicopter in a, at CBS News, we had yellow grapefruit bags, which we made a point to say everybody <laughs> we can run into, if you see a yellow grapefruit bag, get it to Tanzanut Airport in Saigon and transship it to Tokyo. So get the picture, you film at Tom Key one day, the film has to find its way, sort of begging its way to Saigon where a jet plane takes it to Tokyo. In Tokyo, it's transferred to a flight to San Francisco. The flight to San Francisco gets to New York. So generally speaking, there were a few exceptions to this later on in the war, but generally speaking, whatever you saw on the evening news was at least three or four days Oh, compare that to, to, to today, where if the story is three or four days old, it's not, it probably is not going to see, see air. The, the lack of communication, not just for journalistic enterprises, that which is to say no telephone service to speak of, no satellite access to speak of, translated also to a sense with troops in the field, and I always want to come back to the, the soldiers Marines, sailors, and airmen who fought this war, that there was a sense of, of, of loneliness, a sense of being an alien in an alien land, which is almost totally different from today. A, a soldier uh, today on a frontline combat thing can get up on Skype and he can talk to his children on their birthday, on their birthday, while he's in the combat region. My point is that this is so far from the reality of coverage in Vietnam, it, it frequently gets overlooked, but it's worth considering, we, we, we talk about the media and the press in general with Vietnam, but the difficulties of getting the story out, never mind the, the pressure from the administration and the propaganda efforts and all of that, just the physical problem of getting uh, reports out. Even for the AP, if Peter's in the field, and it was not unusual for all of you, a correspondent worthy of the name, you're not gonna cover the war from Saigon, or even for that matter, at the Marine Enclave in, in um, uh, up in i corps at tonight, yep. you've got to be in the field. Well, the problem of getting your report from the field to some place where it could be transmitted back to the United States was a Herculean proposition on a day-to-day -day basis. It, I think one of the problems is that you, you have, you know, official statements and, and uh, commitments of troops to one place or another, and it's difficult to find the kind of investigating or, or to get public interest in the kind of investigating <laughs> reporting or inside stories that were common in Vietnam. So the public is missing out on the kind of explanation picture that was, uh, was important. It's important to their understanding. What I think is lacking today in coverage, what you do not see anymore, are what we call the hometown stories about soldiers in action, the daily routine, the sort of uh, the Ernie Pyle kind of reporting yeah, I meet officers in Vietnam, they say, where's the only pile of Vietnam? And a lot of people I know wanted to be the only pile of Vietnam. Including, including myself. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have anyone even considers that. You don't see those stories, because if you're embedded with the US military, they're not, they don't encourage soldiers to talk about much. Maybe well, about football and stuff. That's lacking in the American public and the families of those men who are over there uh, missing out on getting a sensitive view of what's happening. Well, again, I think this is a point worth pondering, that during the Vietnam War, soldiers, including officers, with the possible exception of flag rank officers, which is to say generals, soldiers were, were free to talk to reporters any way they wanted to. Today, even platoon commanders are, are schooled on how to, quote, how to handle the press. Yeah. And uh, they operate under a set of rules. In Vietnam, uh, 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 I, I want to bear witness to, captains and sergeants were the key to knowing how the war was really going. Length and breadth of my own time in Vietnam, I never had anybody 
field grade officer or below tell me anything other than what they really thought was this proof. Now, it was not uncommon. You're taking incoming mortar rounds or uh, heavy fire or something, and uh, the captain, you just say, how's it going, captain? He might say, and I'll clean this up with this audience, he might say, we're getting our butts kicked here. Now, and the coverage would reflect that they were getting their butts yep. kicked in that particular area, if you will. What is now, first of all, you probably couldn't get to a frontline situation where you're taking incoming uh, heavy combat team. Secondly, uh, if you got there, the captain would be very reluctant to talk to any journalist because he's been taught since OCS, be careful of the press. And that seeps down to the sergeants and people down below them. So it's, it's a whole different dynamic. Vietnam, it, it, the advantage of getting into the field is you could find out what was going on, what was really going on, as opposed to what somebody wanted you to believe was going on. So, so where, I mean, where do we go from here? We've investigated a lot of those changes between the, the relationship during the various wars. You've talked about the changes in corporate structure where you have news divisions owned by basically big entertainment companies. All these have made a difference. And then you mentioned technology, which has now produced a complete uh, fragmentation of the media landscape. Um, but you've also, we've also talked about something which may be lost. A lot of this conf conversation has seemed to be about conflict between press and other entities. But you've spoken before about the role the press plays in building trust in a democratic society so it can actually function. If that is at the root of what the fourth estate is all about, how do we move toward building that or rebuilding it in the current context? Now that's a very good point. And what I think has to be done is uh, renegotiating between the mainstream media, the important media organizations, and the military about how to approach the story of young Americans uh, committed to war in several, in several countries whose story is not being told. Today, when you have an incident overseas, uh, like the uh, SEAL Team 6 does something we're never told about it. You wait five years for the books to come out. I think there's been 15 to 20 books on the death of Saddam, uh, the death of bin Laden. And even, so the, there's a delay in learning what these, these boys are doing over there. And I think there should be, Pentagon should get together with media uh, operatives and talk about how do we improve the embedding to where we get to tell the story more about what these uh, young people are doing. I mean, this is the biggest story for America. Young men sent overseas, 300 I think going to Syria soon. Some will give their lives. Now what they're doing is far more important than, you know, than all the political campaigns being launched at this Amen. moment that dominate, that dominate the no news. Point. Got it. <laughs> Amen to that. On the micro scale, on a macro picture, talking about, it is true that in a society such as ours, a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy, it's absolutely essential, never more imperative than during wartime, that there be a high degree of communicable trust between the leadership and the led. And what happened in, in Vietnam a lot of that communicable trust that had been built up over the years during the Depression, during the Great World War II period, was fractured and got worse as time went along. Now your question is, where do we move from here? Well, one, you know, better heads than mine would have to come up with a lengthy answer to that question. But you could begin with political leaders, whether they be Republican, Democrat, Mugwump, Independent, or whatever understanding how vital it is to build that trust with the public. And you can't build that trust if you run an administration, whether it's this county judge or president of the United States, if you're operating behind the scenes in an atmosphere and you create an atmosphere leader of deceit and lawlessness. And it's an unfortunate, unpleasant truth, but it is the truth. As the Vietnam War wore on, and we went from the Kennedy administration where it basically started through the Johnson administration. By the time we got to the Nixon administration, there's no joy in saying this, the record is now very clear. You had an administration led by a, a, a president 
who, who did deal in deceit, who did deal in lawlessness, and reaching, uh, repairing this split between the trust of the public and the leadership. Look, reporters are trained to be skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical, to ask questions. And the responsibility of citizens, I'm not here <laughs> to preach on it, is also to be skeptical. Yes, you should always say, well, okay, that's what they're saying. What's, you know, what's the truth behind them? But with political leadership, it, it begins there. There has to be a rededication to the understanding of it. You can't go to war. You can't sustain a war, much less have any hope of winning the war, unless there is what I call this high degree of communicable trust between the leadership and the led. Go to the invasion of Iraq. What the president said were the reasons for going into Iraq were not true. Now, people can argue, well, did he know it was not true or not? But whether he did or didn't know what was true or not, he had plenty of reasons to question it. So we've had this fracture between leadership, and I think for the foreseeable future, this is going to uh, cause us continual problems. Sometimes war is imperative. America's entry in World War II was not a choice. It was, it was imperative. But, you know, one having the public recognize what war is, what it really is, and my concern about television coverage of war is it tends to flatten war out. Uh, it, it lacks, it, there are many advantages to television coverage of war, but in general, television coverage lacks perspective, context, particularly any his, historical context. And the very fact that you have a flat screen, it's kind of hard to describe it. I think the late Eric Shevride once said, with, with the television camera, the viewer has to understand when he's looking at, say, war coverage, that the, the camera's a little like a flashlight. The camera shows you what's at the end of the beam, but you, it doesn't show you what's above, below, or at either side of the beam. So understanding the limitations of television coverage, and then back to your question from which I diverted some, this business of building trust, it's going, to be, it's going to be slow, but we have to start sometime, and for one man's opinion, now would be a good time to start. I have a last comment quickly. Please. I want to tell you that new generation of young journalists being produced mm -hmm. by this university mm -hmm. and others around the United States mm -hmm. are up to the challenge. They want to get out. The, the successes of, of Dan Rather and myself and David Halberstamp, they want to emulate what we do. They're ready to go out and with the cooperation of the military and the news industry, they want to get out and tell the story about American boys overseas. And I hope that will happen. Well, what, what we feared would happen, happened. We ran out of time <laughs> without taking this farther. So you'll have to find uh, Dan or Peter afterwards to ask them questions. Or if you're still mad at them at their coverage of Vietnam from the Johnson administration, you can pull them aside there too. But uh, please, please join me in thanking them for a fantastic and insightful panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you.